So welcome to today's interspecies conversation. This is a regular online lecture and workshop series that gives the opportunity to invite leading professors, scientists, researchers, and students to share and present work that contributes to advancing the acceleration and understanding of the diversity, forms, and functions of communication in other species. We aim to showcase emerging ideas, and discoveries and host open discussions where the community can join the conversation with ideas and feedback. Today we're going to hear a lecture titled Bats in Translation by Dr. Miriam Kornschild. She's a cognitive scientist studying bats. She's professor for evolutionary ethology at the Humboldt Universität zu Berlin and leads a research department at the Museum of Natural History in Germany. Miriam is also a research associate of the Smithsonian Tropical Institute in Panama. She has been investigating the communicative and cognitive abilities of wild bats for over 20 years. She is particularly interested in vocal production learning and the cultural transmission of song dialects. So today we will hear from Miriam and I'll pass over now. Thank you very much, Miriam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kate, for inviting me and for the introduction. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, I apologize in advance. I'm a little, um, I have a cold. So if my voice gives away and I cough at you, I'm very sorry in advance. Okay, let me just um, share my screen. <clears throat> you should see my presentation mode. Is that correct, Kate? Perfect. Okay, let me just get a different pointer really quickly and then we're good to go. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about bats and what my lab and I have learned in studying them for over 20 years with regard to their social behavior and vocal communication. But before I do start, I'd like to highlight the fact that there is actually a lot of bats out there. So I keep updating this number every time I show this introductory slide because the numbers change so often. So currently we have over 1,400 species of bats worldwide, and they come in all forms and sizes and with an extraordinary variety of both trophic and sensory specializations. So what you're probably familiar with is the typical insect eating bat that uses echolocation to orient and navigate, but it also uses dynamic auditory scene analysis to uh, decipher the world. When you go to the tropics, you may also encounter frugivorous bats that have unique olfactory receptor pattern that's allow, that allow them to detect the scent of ripening fruits. Or you find carnivorous bats who not only use echolocation calls, but also multi-sensory integration, so prey-generated sounds like the croaks of this rather unfortunate frog to forage. Um, they are also sangivorous bats, the, the vampire bats of the world, three species in total, that have infrared sensors to detect blood vessels that are running close to the skin. And then last but not least, they are the nectar drinking bats that have ultraviolet vision to detect uh, the blooming flowers at night. And bats not only have this variety of sensory specializations, they also have a large diversity of mating systems and social structures. They go all the way from monogamous family groups, just you know, parents with their offspring of the current year, to polygynous harem groups, promiscuous mixed sex groups, um, and then also leg mating where multiple males compete for females in a designated arena. And of course, all that diversity, both in terms of sensory specializations and social structures, gives bats as a taxon a really high comparative potential, which is interesting when you want to study the evolutionary origins of specific traits that animals have. I'm particularly interested in vocal communication. And for that, bats are really well suited as well, because I would argue that echolocation is really a pre-adaptation for complex vocal communication. So I'm sure you all know how echolocation works. Bats um, produce um, normally high frequency sounds that are really loud, and then they interpret the echoes that are bouncing off objects like prey items or objects in their surroundings to interpret the world. <clears throat> you probably also know that these echolocation calls can be produced in the larynx or also uh, with the tongue, without the larynx, just as tongue clicks, and they can be emitted either through the mouth or the nose. Echolocation calls also have a really high interspecific signal diversity, which makes it possible to differentiate different species based on their echolocation calls. 
And the calls can really range anywhere from clearly in our audible range, like the lowest echolocation calls ever recorded or nine kilohertz, the highest are over 220 kilohertz. They can be really super short, 0 0.2 milliseconds or um, 70 milliseconds long, in, depending on in which species you're looking at. So bats can really do a lot with their vocal apparatus. And they are also within a species, not between species, but within a species, they're really flexible when it comes to um, their signal production. So what you see here is um, a spectrogram showing frequency here on the y-axis over time on the x-axis. And you see the echolocation calls of a European bat changing as this bat is homing in on its insect prey. And right here, it captures the prey and flies on. Each of these calls is under active neuromuscular control and can be flexibly adjusted with regard to frequency, bandwidth, length, to actually optimally suit this task. And what this means is that bat equilocation shows really high vocal plasticity, even within a given species or a given individual. And also, bats have to have a really precise um, vocal motor and also auditory uh, integration to really make echolocation work. And they can use that this um, these uh, adaptations for vocal communication, of course, as well. So echolocating bats not only produce echolocation calls, they also produce a variety of other intricate social vocalizations. And just to get the terminology straight in the beginning of the talk, I'd like to spend like a minute on it. So echolocation calls like the ones you see here and you saw earlier, they're naturally selected calls. They have a quite simple structure, even though the structure can vary over time. Whereas social calls can either be naturally selected or sexually selected, mating calls, for instance. And nevertheless, they have a comparatively simple structure. They can be tonal, like the example here, or they can be noisy, like the screech call down here. And then on the other hand, there are songs. Songs are always sexually selected, so they are produced in the context of rival deterrence or mate attraction. And compared to calls, they have a more complex spectrotemporal structure, meaning they have different syllable types, like you can see here in this example, that are also arranged in a specific sequential order. So social vocalizations are both social calls and songs, and songs are the ones that are more complex and always sexually selected. So it may come as a surprise to you that bats sing just as songbirds do. And that's actually very unfortunate because it's not a rare phenomenon. It's just severely understudied. We know that in around 50% of the bat species for which we have described vocal repertoires, male singing uh, has been found. So it's actually not a rare phenomenon. What you see here, and you don't have to uh, look at any details here, this is a, um, a phylogeny of the extant bat families that we have currently. It's 21 different families. And highlighted in blue here are the, are the ones for which we have evidence for song. Um, but I'd actually like to point you uh, to the families here in gray. These are all the families that have not been studied, where we don't have information about social vocalizations at all, really. So um, <clears throat> clearly, um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And um, I'm convinced that bat song is much more common than we currently know. There has been um, a feature article in Science in 2014 um, highlighting bat song and its uh, important and its interest for research questions. And since then, the field has gradually been um, advancing and more singing species have been reported. So I'm hopeful that there is more to come. What do we know so far? We know that just in bird song, bat song can, can encode information on the singer's identity, male quality, the regional origin, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to play you the song of uh, that, uh, that species that you've seen before. This is uh, Natusius pipistrel, a common European bat. And I think it's, it's, it's slowed down uh, eight times and it sounds quite melodic, I think. So I think if you didn't know that this was a bat and you just compared the spectrogram with, say, the song of a Eurasian wren, you would probably agree with me that at least in terms of like spectrotemporal complexity, there is really not much to argue about. Both are complex signals and they're both um, used in the context of um, mate, de uh, mate attraction and rival deterrence. <clears throat> Um, just like bird song, bat song is also caught between elaborations and constraint. So we know quite a bit about elaborations. So we know that some species have a really high song output 
They have large syllable repertoires and in some species songs can also be interactive, but we really don't know very much about constraints, especially when compared to the bulk of knowledge that there is in birds. So what we really don't know is the energetic costs of singing in bats. We know the energetic costs of echolocation, but not of song. We don't know if there are any morphological limitations to what bats can do with their vocal tract or um, you know, their, their, their mouth. And we also don't know if um, male song is shaped by sensory needs of females, as has been shown in birds. So there is a lot more work to do, but I think it's a really fascinating field and one that I'm deeply passionate about. Again, just like uh, bird song, bat song can also be learned by imitating tutors. And I'm also very interested in vocal production learning. I, I don't think I have to explain to this crowd here that vocal production learning is really crucial for speech acquisition in human infants as well. So if you're interested in the evolution of speech and language in a comparative view, it makes sense to also study you know, the different key components of speech in extant animals and one of these key components is vocal production learning and vocal production learning has been shown in bats i've already told you that there is a lot of vocal plasticity just in echolocation calls and that's a pre-adaptation for vocal production learning so it probably doesn't come as a surprise that we have evidence now that vocal production learning in different species can shape both social calls and song we also know that it can be found in juveniles and adults of both sexes and we find two different types of vocal production learning. We find social modification, which is the um, gradual change of an innate signal over time based on social influences. And we also find like de novo imitation where a new signal is acquired by listening to conspecifics and then trying to get it right, basically. So bats, I think, are really promising mammalian taxon to address both um, the proximate mechanisms and also like the evolutionary consequences of vocal production learning. Um, for many years, vocal production learning has been seen as like a binary trait species either had it or didn't have it. But this um, view has been challenged and is changing uh, since a few years. So now we have this continuum theory of vocal production learning first put forward by Eric Jarvis. Um, that basically arranges species on a continuum of ability when it comes to the mastery of their um, of their larynx or their syrinx and their vocal tract. So what you see basically here is the, the different domains of vocal production learning, which are respiratory, phonatory, and filter domain, and how they correspond um, to the anatomy here, of course, is a human, but also the anatomy of the different species. And then you have this continuum of ability here that goes from really subtle modifications that often take a very long time to you know at the at the top end the imitation of vocalizations of other species or completely novel sounds like we can do parrots can do and a few other species can as well and bats are located right here on in the middle of that continuum and i think that given their really speciose nature as a taxon is uh, really um <clears throat> well suited because we need a cross-species approach to understand the evolution of vocal production learning and also the potential diversity of neural and molecular mechanisms. Because at present, right here, we're looking at the phenotypic output, basically, what the species can do, but we're not really in a comparative way looking at a lot of neural and also molecular, molecular mechanisms. And that's something I think bats are really well suited for. So, how is the current evidence for vocal production learning in bats? Uh, again, here you see that uh, rather daunting extant phylogeny with the 21 different um, bat families. And again, highlighted in blue, only this time it's other blue families, are the species for which we have evidence for vocal production learning. It's currently five different families and six different species. Um, <clears throat> and they are uh, spread over almost all the major branches uh, of the phylogeny. So again, uh, I think vocal production learning is much more common in bats and we currently have evidence for it's just not really um, well studied yet. Um, I'm going to focus for the rest of my talk on this one species, Sacopteryx bilineata. It's an M. Bolinurid, um, and uh, this is uh, a species that my lab has been studying for over 20 years. <clears throat> So let me introduce you to the greater sac-winged bat, Sacopteryx bilineata. Um, uh, spoiler alert, it's an elaborate singer and it's also a vocal production learner. That's why I'm mainly interested in this bat. And um, we know 
a lot about these bats just from um, observing them wild in following them in the wild. So it's, it's not a species that does well in captivity, but you can study it really well in the wild. And part of the reason we know so much about the species is that this is basically, you know, it's it's natural um, habitat. It's it's fairly diurnal for a bat. So it spends most of its day awake and interacting socially and it spends its night foraging, but really briefly and then basically resting and sleeping. So that means that we have a chance to really get the majority of all the relevant social interaction of these bats by studying them in their day roosts. And this picture that you see here has been taken without a flash in the natural day roost of this species. So they roost in broad daylight. They like the shade, so they, they don't like direct sunlight, but they really like well illuminated roosts. They have really large eyes for bats, as you can see here. So um, they also communicate not only vocally and olfactorily, but also visually. And they um, this basically this quirk of their natural history, of course, enables us to study them in really great detail and with comparative ease, um, when, especially when you compare it to species that live in uh, dark caves, for instance. So I think it's a, a really good example of you know what we can learn about bats if we were able to study all the species as we um, should be. So what do we know about its social structure? <clears throat> well, we know that the species has really perennial colonies. Um, it's a neotropical species. It feeds on insects. And um, as long as the colony structure, for instance, this um, almost dead tree um, stands, then the same bats will be sitting on this tree in, in pretty much exactly the same spots um, every day throughout their whole lives. So these colonies um, are really perennial. What we also know is that this species has a resource defense polygyny, so um, it's organized in harem groups. So each harem male um, defends, you know, one or two square meters of surface area in a day roost against other males, and um, territories of adjacent uh, of, har of neighboring harems can be directly adjacent to one another, so sharing like one um, territory boundary that is also heavily disputed. And then these harem males um, try to convince females to roost in their territories. And then we have floating bachelor males um, on the outside of these male territories that are basically waiting for their turn um, to take over one of these harems. And what you'd see here is uh, one of those harems uh, uh, in the wild, and there would be another harem directly adjacent to it that you can't see right now, it's outside of this picture. What we also know is there is pronounced female choice. So what you see here is a harem now at the outside of a building, and this male here is performing a hovering flight in front of a female. So these are five females in his harem, and he's courting them every day um, throughout the whole year. And you also see that there are some of these bats have like these tiny little light marks on their forearms. These are um, <clears throat> These are wing bands that have different colors. It's only black and white here because this was a high speed um, video recording. And these um, individual markings enable us to identify these bats um, at a distance. And as you can also see, they are not clumped together in tight clusters, but they roost um, with um, you know one or two body lengths apart. And together with a highly directional microphone, we can then really get recordings of individually identifiable bats while they're behaving naturally in their day roost. We can also get really close to them. So both this video and this photo were taken with less than two meters away from these bats actually. So we really get a really good idea of what's going on um, in their colonies. And once they're habituated, they really don't care at all if we are present or not. These colonies have a patrilinear um, structure. That means that males stay in the colony they are born in and females disperse to new colonies. That means males in a colony um, are related to one another. That's a really um, unusual pattern in mammals. It's um, normally the other way around that, you know, there is um, female relatives in social groups and the males disperse, but in this bats, it's exactly the other way around. That means, of course, that males um, compete with male relatives for mating access to these females in those colonies. So there is local mate competition and then can be that can be quite severe. But there is also joint male um, colony defense when intruding males who have not, not been born in this colony try to take over um, a harem in there. So that it's also an advantage to roost with relatives. 
The average lifespan of our bats is seven years and the maximum we ever recorded is 16 years. That's medium for uh, bats. So uh, I think the age record is 42 years in, in bats as a taxon. So that's actually not a very long lived bat species, but it's also not particularly short lived. So what do we know about its vocal communication? What we have because of its really um, a uh, very researcher friendly uh, natural history, um, we have a fully described vocal repertoire. So we know all the vocalizations these bats are producing, and we know the social context in which these vocalizations are being produced, which of course helps us tremendously to work with these species with this species. So we know that the adult vocal repertoire consists of 25 different syllable types. And uh, I, myself, and my lab, we are more lumpers than splitters. So that's really the, the minimum number of different syllable types that you can think of. If you wanted to look at more fine grain differences, there would be more syllable types, but that's the number we work with. And these syllable types can be combined in various way into 10 different vocalization types that are each associated with a very specific behavioral context including in these 10 different vocalization types are two different song types because males sing year round and I'm going to tell you about these songs in a second. We also have complex multimodal displays that are accompanying the vocalizations like this hover flight that you've seen in the high speed video earlier and as I will show you in a second, we have vocal production learning in the species and quite an unusual vocal ontogeny in the pup. So what you see here is a mother and um, her about six week old pup. So they have one pup per year and also only like uh, um, one pup per mother. So it's a, it's a very, very tight mother offspring bond. So coming to the song types, uh, we have two different song types uh, in the greater sack wing bats. We have courtship songs. Uh, here is just an excerpt, again, frequency over time. Courtship songs are around 40 seconds long, and this is uh, maybe like a uh, maybe a two second long excerpt. They're purely ultrasonic and they're organized in distinct motifs. And then on the other hand, we have territorial songs. They're much shorter. They are 1.5 seconds long. Um, so that, that would be a short example, but a complete example of a territorial song. The lower frequencies are audible and they have these graded syllables that kind of like merge into one another until they end with these distinct pulsed syllables in the end that we call bus syllables. Courtship songs are only used for short range communication. So males produce them to court females in their harem, in their direct vicinity, whereas territorial songs are used for both short and long range communication. Um, territorial songs are fairly unusual for bats because they're really low in frequency. So these bats, they weigh around eight grams. <laughs> and um, so they're really tiny and their um, territorial songs go as low as seven kilohertz, which is, that, that's really very low for a bat that size. They're also very loud. We measured 96 dB SPL at one meter distance, and that translates depending on where you are into an active space of around 180 meters, meaning that when you walk through the forest and you listen for these bats singing at dawn and dusk when they produce mostly these territorial songs, you can actually detect new colonies just by listening to the zo songs and then homing in on them because they spread through the forest fairly well. We know a lot about territorial songs and uh, later in the talk, I'm going to focus on territorial songs. Our work on courtship song is still in its um, beginnings because it's more difficult to work with that song type, um, but uh, it's also a very interesting one. What we do know about both songs is that the produced song type is really dependent on the intended receivers. It's not just that males produce courtship songs when they feel friendly and territorial songs when they feel aggressive. It's really depending on whom they want to address. So we did um, a playback experiments in which we confronted roosting harem males in their day roost with echolocation eco calls of an approaching male or echolocation calls of an approaching females, and they reacted accordingly. Approaching males were always greeted with barks, which is also an aggressive vocalization and territorial song, whereas approaching females were always um, greeted with courtship songs. So that tells us both that harem males can distinguish between male and female conspecifics based on echolocation calls alone, and that they can respond appropriately so that the song type is really dependent on whom they want to address. You should be able to hear such a song now. 
I hope you heard that. So that's a, a male territorial song. It's produced while the male is sitting in its territory, basically announcing its presence, announcing its ownership. It's sometimes accompanied by visual um, threat displays like this wing waving that you've um, seen. Um, that's that's also very common when the males produce these territorial songs. As I've said earlier, they're produced mainly at dusk and dawn, um, just like songbirds would produce their, their dawn chorus. Um, but they are also produced uh, throughout the rest of the day when there was a disturbance in the colony. Here is again a spectrogram in um, here in uh, in two lines, frequency over time, and you see um, again how these syllables merge into these end syllables that are really distinct and really low frequency. Um, we know quite a bit about these um, territorial songs and what personal information is encoded in them. So we know that these songs have an individual signature. So um, we and also other bats can tell um, individual males apart based on territorial songs alone. We know that the motivational status um, of the singer is encoded in these songs. So the longer and lower frequency the songs are, the more aggressive are the males. We also know that there is a colony signature that allows um, listeners to associate males with their natal um, uh, colony, their natal origin. And we also know that most of this personal information is encoded in the bus syllables. So it's basically redundant information that is produced over and over again at the end of these songs. What you see here is um, a, basically a, a visual representation of such a colony signature. It's a signal space defined by, uh, in this case, two discriminant functions. And the distance in the signal space is a proxy for acoustic similarity, meaning that um, points that are close together, in, in this case, uh, each of these small symbols represents uh, an individual bat um, from five different colonies. and you can see that males from the same colony cluster together in the signal space, and that's um, a visual representation showing that there is a colony signature so, so that we can statistically tell males apart um, based on their songs and uh, associate them with different colonies. <clears throat> what is um, also really interesting about the territorial song is how it emerges basically throughout ontogeny. I told you earlier that these um, bats have a really unusual ontogeny for a bat and I'd like to go into detail a little bit. So what young bats of all the other species studied to date are normally producing our echolocation calls or echolocation call precursors, depending on the species, and isolation calls, which is what they use to communicate with their mothers, um, to solicit care or help uh, when they're in trouble. And Sacopteryx bilinata pups do that as well. They produce echolocation calls and isolation calls, but they produce other things as well. Um, pups of both sexes produce really long vocal sequences while they are learning how to sing. And what you see here is basically a timeline from birth until uh, weaning, which happens around 10 to 12 weeks of age. And then at around 12 weeks of age, young females leave their natal colony and disperse to a new colony. And there they settle then normally for life. Flight onset is normally between three and four weeks of age. So that's like the, the major um, behavioral uh, developments uh, in the pups. And what you see here is a large sensory motor learning phase starting at week two and ending at around week 12, um, where you, in, in the beginning, you have innate isolation calls that are present directly after birth. They're, as I said, used to solic solicit maternal care. And when the pups are around two weeks of age, they start to modify these isolation calls. They start to change them slightly. And then starting on around three weeks of age, we have um, really feeble weak precursors of the adult territorial song that are getting more and more adult like until at around eight weeks of age they have this complete adult like territorial song but in addition to what i've just told you about the isolation calls and these territorial song or song precursors bats produce really long vocal sequences in which a lot of syllables are combined in a really weird way and I'd like to play you a little video um, where you see a mother. She's banded with these color bands that I've told you about and her pup. And what you see here, once I start the video, is in real time the spectrogram of all the vocalization the pup is producing. You can sometimes see that the mouth is opening or the snout is twitching a little bit. And sometimes you can only see the chest vibrating when the really low frequency vocalizations um, are being produced. So 
So this behavior is really, really unusual for bat pups. In, in other species, this is something that we have not observed before. So we decided to study that more. And we also knew um, from um, previous studies that um, pups of both sexes learn the territorial song that I've shown you earlier, uh, even though intriguingly in adults, only the males produce the territorial song, but nevertheless, females learn it when they are young as well. And since these um, territorial song precursors were basically Im like embedded in these long vocal sequences, we decided to look at these long vocal sequences somewhat more. It turns out um, that pups spend a really surprisingly large amount of their diurnal activity time with these vocal sequences, with vocal practice. So for seven to 10 weeks of their ontogeny, they spend around 30% of their active time producing these long vocal sequences. So it's really not a rare or, um, uh, uh, yeah, it's not a rare behavior. It's it's something that is is uh, really, um, really obvious um, and a really dominant behavior once the pups are small. And these vocal sequences contain adult-like syllables and they call also like weird things the pups are producing and we call these weird things undifferentiated protosyllables. So what you see here is just a small selection of the 25 different adult syllable types. Um, here in, in blue, uh, in, in green are the adult versions, um, two aggressive syllables, um, two neutral ones and three affiliative ones. And then here in, in blue uh, on the upper row are the pup versions. And you can see it's not an exact copying, but it's close enough that you can actually just by, by looking at the spectrograms and obviously, of course, also by measuring the spectrograms, you can see what the pups are aiming at, what, what different syllable type they are trying to get right, basically. Um, and the syllables of the learned territorial song are among the first syllable types to emerge in these long vocal sequences. So what you see here is uh, what I've called a song precursor. So this is a four week old pup and this has really no real resemblance to the adult um, territorial song that is um, shown here at the bottom of the slide. You know, you have some buzz like syllables, but there is weird stuff coming afterwards and um, it's it's really not it's not very convincing yet. But the same pup uh, four weeks later is producing something that sounds almost adult like it's still not as pulsed here in the bus syllables as it's supposed to be, but you can clearly see the vocal development where that pup is really getting at. Um, that's at like the song level now, but if you just look at the syllable level, it turns out that these bus syllables are really the first syllables to emerge in these very long vocal sequences. Um, and because this behavior was so unusual, but also so, so omnipresent, really, the pups were, you know, putting so much effort into it and doing it so regularly. We were wondering whether these vocal sequences resembled something like vocal play, whether they could be, in fact, compared to um, the babbling behavior that is also found in human infants. What you see here is a spectrum, just a very small excerpt, um, six seconds long um, of such um, a vocal sequence. The sequences are on average seven minutes long and the maximum sequence we ever recorded was 43 minutes. So that's 43 minutes of almost continuous vocalizations with a few breaks for breathing, right? Um, coming out of a pup <laughs> and that's, I cannot stress enough how extraordinary and unusual this is for a bat because normally bat communication is really very short, <laughs> um, right? So echolocation calls in this species are eight milliseconds. So, you know, any vocalization that is seven minutes long is like really long already, right? And 43 minutes is of course epic, basically. Um, and when you look closer into this excerpt, you can see there is a couple of like really weird stuff that you don't find in the adult vocal repertoire. This is what we call these undifferentiated protosyllables. And we, we personally, we're currently working on that, but we, we think they're basically the like the vocal glue holding together <laughs> all these more crystallized syllables that the pups are producing as well. And then you have adult like syllables, in this case, like adult like song syllables. So this here, these these bus syllables and also these um, syllables before that is what you would find in adult territorial song. But of course, in these babbling bows, it's embedded in, in all the other syllables. And we really wanted to know whether this unusual behavior has some reminiscence to what we find in human infants when they are acquiring um, basically their, um, their first phonemes. 
So um, this is work that is really spearheaded by my former PhD student and now postdoc, Ahana Fernandez. She basically went through a lot of um, linguistic literature and tried to find um, features that are defining um, human infant babblings across different languages and cultures. And then we tried to see whether these um, features that she could identify in the literature were also present in our bats. And it turns out they were to um, a surprisingly high degree. So in both human infants and our bats, there is a really early and rapid ontogenetic onset of this babbling behavior or vocal play behavior, however you want to call it. <clears throat> in both humans and bats, there are clearly recognizable adult-like syllables, but also weird stuff that is called vocal overproduction. Um, so these undifferentiated protosyllables that we had discussed earlier, or like weird sounds babies are making that adults are normally not making, that would be that vocal overproduction. In both humans and our bats, we only have um, a, a subset of adult syllables that are acquired. So not all the phonemes in, in any given human language are acquired in babbling, only a subset, and that's the same in our bats. And the acquisition pattern of these syllables is also non-linear. So it's not that a new syllable um, or phoneme is acquired every week or every other week. It comes in spurts, and then there is a plateau, and then nothing seems to change, and then you know there is a new acquisition. So it's non-linear. And then, of course, the most salient features that you know everyone I think associates with human infant babbling is repetitiveness and rhythmicity. So ba ba ga da da. That's of course both repetitive and rhythmic, and that's what we mainly associate with babbling. And that's also what we found in our bats. So I'd like to just very briefly walk you um, through uh, four of these features. Um, if you want to read more, check out uh, Hannah's really cool article. Um, Subset acquisition. So what you see here on the y-axis is the number of acquired adult syllable types. Uh, in total, you can only have 25 because that's what the adults are producing. And here is the pup's vocal ontogeny from birth to weaning in days. And what you see here is it basically plateaus at around 19 or maximum 20 syllable types. So only a subset of the 25 adult types is actually ever produced in these long vocal sequences. Um, when we look at the emergence of different syllable types, um, we uh, see here the syllable type acquisition rate in percentages, this time not in, in real uh, numbers on the y-axis, and then the time after babbling onset. Um, in days, um, we see that you know most adult syllable types actually emerge in the first five days after the pups um, uh, produce these long vocal sequences for the first time, which uh, to us um, is at least uh, suggesting that they pay a lot of attention before they start producing things, and then a lot of things, uh, a lot of syllables are being produced um, at the same time, and then it kind of like dwindles off, and you have Recording more. You have more you syllable have types. Syllable types. Um, you have more syllable types being being produced uh, later on or being acquired later on, but in total, the pattern is really nonlinear. Um, when we're coming to repetitiveness, most of the syllable types that we labeled, and Ahana labeled over 55,000 syllable types in these babbling bouts, most of them, so over 77%, are self-repeating, so they follow after one another. Not all of them are. If all of them were, we would have like a complete diagonal here in this heat map, which is the proportion of reduplicated syllable types. So some of them were really different. They were not reduplicated, but a lot of them were, so in total 77%. And when it comes to rhythmicity, um, we found that babbling pups produce syllables with a regular beat at the onset of syllables. Um, there's a number of different ways to measure rhythmicity. We decided for a very simple one, we measured the normalized pairwise variability index. And basically, the lower that um, index is, the more isochronous is a sequence, so the more of a regular beat it has. And babbling uh, overall um, has a fairly regular beat. So. Um, and that's true for all the different syllable categories in which we could, you know, basically um, uh, uh, put our different syllable types. So this is this UPS stands again for um, undifferentiated protosyllables, so the stuff that only the pups are producing, and um, the other ones are the adult syllable types. So we could. Um, conclusively show that infant and bat babbling share these similar features, which is, of course, interesting because we're phylogenetically very distinct, right? So it's um, it's really interesting to speculate whether 
babbling may help to master a large vocal repertoire or you know whether there are other reasons why you know this particular bat species is babbling and then so many other species with complex vocal repertoires don't do that what we're currently interested in is whether there are more similarities in the vocal ontogeny of infants and pups. So we know, of course, in human infants, that maternal feedback or parental feedback has a drastic influence in both the speed of language acquisition or, or speech acquisition, and also the precision in which things are being learned. And that's something that uh, Ahana Fernandez, again, is um, working on now. We know already that there, when pups are babbling, there can be mother-pup interactions, vocal exchanges between mother and pup, or pup, also hover flights, and babbling behavior can be initiated by both mothers or it can be self-initiated by pups. So Ahana is currently testing whether more um, active mothers that are more interacting with their um, pups um, have offspring that learn faster or better, but that's um, work in progress. Um, moving away from how things are learned to what actually the consequences of vocal learning is. I'm, a, I'm an evolutionary biologist, so I'm mainly interested in consequences, really. So what does it mean for, for a given species is if at least part of its vocal repertoire um, can be shaped by vocal learning? And the consequences of vocal production learning in, in this territorial song is that you have learned song dialects. I've shown you earlier, just visually in a spectrogram, that um, this imitation is not 100% accurate, so there are small differences, and these differences can accumulate over time, and they can lead to really distinct regional song dialects. And this, uh, again, allows us to discriminate population based on song parameters. What you can see here, again, is um, a signal space, again, defined by, uh, in this case, two discriminant functions, and you see here the acoustic position of 27 males and of course multiple territorial songs per male from th three different regions and these regions are color coded here and the position of the the males are these you know, these different symbols here um, and even though there is some overlap between these three different population we can clearly discriminate um, the population of the males in these population based on the parameters of their territorial song and i'm going to play you two territorial songs now from two different populations the the red one and the blue one and um, you can uh, just by listening to them uh, hear that they sound different of course we can measure that so that's the red population or one male from the red population and that's the blue population. Um, and we also know that when we compare the acoustic distance between these different populations with the genetic distance, we don't find a correlation. And we also know that the habitat between these populations is comparable, so there are no sound transmission differences uh, in, in the habitat that could you know, cause selection pressure on these songs to be different. And together with the fact that um, we know that territorial songs themselves are learned during autogeny by listening to the song of adult tutors. We can conclude that the song dialects that we find are influenced by vocal production learning and they're culturally transmitted from one generation to the next. And that, of course, is very interesting, but just that we can measure differences doesn't really mean that these differences mean anything for the for the bats, right? I mean, you can measure minute differences that have no biological relevance whatsoever, right? So for us, it was really important to test whether song dialects are really functional relevant for females. And we decided to focus on females and not on males, because females have this peculiar behavior that... Um, as I told you already, they leave their natal colony at around 10 to 12 weeks of age, and they find a new colony and they settle there normally for life. And the question is now, how do they find that new colony? So this is a neotropical rainforest where these bats live. And of course, you know, a day roost could be on any of these larger trees that you see in this area, right? So it would make sense to use some sort of cue to home in on a on a, a new day roost and then decide whether to settle there or not. So we basically wanted to know, first of all, do territorial songs elicit phonotaxis in dispersing females, which means do they show really direct approach behavior when we broadcast territorial songs from a loudspeaker? So do they find new colonies by homing in on these territorial songs? And if they do, 
do they pay attention to songs belonging to different dialect zones or does it not matter do they just you know basically approach any territorial song no matter the the dialect and in order to do that we did a fairly unusual playback design where we basically selected locations that would be suitable roost for these bats but where there weren't any bats and then we hoisted a speaker you know with a series of strings up in a tree <laughs> and that speaker then produced um, for three minutes either territorial songs with a local dialect with a foreign dialect from one particular area or from another area and then well, of course the order of that was randomized we used 12 different territorial songs per trial per three minute um, and we didn't count um, um, echolocation call activity or something as a response we really wanted to capture the individuals approaching the speakers so we also pulled up a really small mist net that is used for bat catching a two by two meter mist net in a frame and we placed that right in front of our speaker in the tree so that we if any bat was approaching the speaker um, we would uh, capture the bat as it was trying to land next to the speaker. So we weren't interested in any bats flying around in the air. We wanted ones that are really trying to make contact with our speaker, basically. And when I told my colleagues that I wanted to do that, they were like, yeah, that's never going to work because you're basically you're playbacking to free flying individuals, you know, in, in the wild and you're trying to sing them out of the sky, trying to make them land next to your speaker. Why would they do that? And I was like, well, they need to find new colonies. So if I do that during dispersal times when females are looking, I think I can get an answer. And it turns out I can. So um, again, for you, uh, as a reminder, this is what you've seen before, that signal space. And we were testing bats in that uh, yellow population here. It's a population in Panama. So this the yellow here is the local dialect. And then we have two foreign dialects. And here are the results. So first of all, um, yes, we could sing females out of the sky. They showed clear phonotaxis, but only really when we produce songs with the local dialect. So in the majority of cases, they only reacted when we played songs from the local dialect. Mind you, these were not males they were familiar with. So that were males that um, already died a few years ago. So these young females had no chance of actually knowing these, these males. So these were alien songs, but you know, in one case from their own dialect zone, and then in these two other cases from different dialect zones. And you know, with two exceptions, um, they only reacted to the local dialect. So that tells us not only that females actually use dialects to find, uh, use territorial songs to find new colonies when they're trying to settle um, after dispersal, but they really prefer the local dialect. And what we think happens when a bat flies over um, the, the forest in Panama um, at dawn is that um, males, return to their colonies a few minutes earlier than the females and then they start this dawn chorus they start singing and we think that these territorial songs really function as acoustic beacons because they travel so widely that females can actually use them to orient and if they want to find a new colony and just for you for orientation so this is Barro Colorado Island uh, a research station located in the Panama Canal and here is a lab building and uh, right here on this lab building is a balcony and there I used to drink my morning coffee and here over there is sloth island that's a tiny little uh, island that had one singing male and i could hear that male on the balcony over this expanse of water so just to give you an expression of you know me with my not so very good human ears how far i could hear such a song so i'm sure the bats can do that even more so i think in the morning at dawn the forest is alight with acoustic beacons with these singing males and females can use that to make decisions and these are really important decisions where to settle down for life where to have your offspring right because once the females are settled they normally don't leave their um their new colony ever again but if female dispersal females really prefer local song dialects as our playbacks have suggested then these dialect barriers could be dispersal barriers for females right if they find other dialects so repelling right they may not go there and they are the dispersing sex so dialect barriers could be dispersal barriers and that of course means that populations could be genetically more isolated because they're dispersal barriers 
So these culturally transmitted dialects could in fact accelerate speciation. And that's of course an intriguing thought and we are not the first ones to have thought that thought, but normally people face that problem that when you have genetically distinct populations and you have different dialects, you don't know what came first, right? The classic hen and egg problem. You don't know if the genetic differentiation came first and then the dialects are basically on top of that or if, you know, it's the other way around. And normally you cannot tell that apart because you only have this one glimpse in time. But we um, are in the lucky situation that this bat spe species that we've been studying for 20 years is actually a ring species. And we've only become aware of that very recently. So this is work spearheaded by my postdoc, Martina Nagy, who is uh, doing genomics uh, in this species. And typically speciation happens in time. You have like this ancestral population and it splits up into two new species. And of course the intermediate types and the old you know, ancestral species is not there anymore. You only have these two new species, right? But in ring speciation, speciation actually happens in space because you have this ancestral population that, for instance, migrates around a mountain chain or a large lake or whatever the barrier, depending on the species. And then basically you have two distinct species at the end, you know, where the, where the terminal forms of the ring meet again, but they are still connected through a chain of existing populations to the ancestral population. And that means that in ring species, you can trace the speciation process and its drivers in space instead of in time. You can just basically go back in space, which is like going back in time and see, okay, what came first, you know, genetic differentiation or acoustic differentiation? Are dialects following, you know, genetic differentiation or are they driving that genetic differentiation? And we are in the lucky situation that we can actually do that with our bats and we're currently doing that. So we, we currently have an ERC grant that is called CultSong where we basically want to answer whether culture, cultural differences can be an evolutionary force, whether these learned sexually selected song dialects in, in our Sarcopteryx bats can accelerate speciation. And I don't have time to go into any uh, details and um, our analysis is also not complete yet, but we not only have the species I've been telling you about that shows this um, speciation around a barrier, we also have its sister species that lives in the same habitat. It's completely sympatric. It doesn't show that ring speciation, but it also doesn't have culturally selected um, song dialects. So we're really interesting to see how that, you know, how that unfolds. But I'm uh, uh, at the moment, I don't have more than a gut feeling, but I think uh, I, I really think it, it could be that cultural differences are driving speciation or accelerating speciation in, in this particular bat species, which is, of course, super exciting. Um, so in a nutshell, because I know this was a lot, this is my last slide. Um, what have I told you about vocal production learning and song in Sarcopteryx bilineata? Well, I've told you um, about local song dialects in this territorial song. I've told you, even though I haven't shown you data, that they are transmitted via vocal learning. I've shown you that they're relevant for females. They may accelerate speciation. What I haven't shown you, but, but what I'm really excited about, this just came in, that's, that's work of um, um, a PhD student of mine, Maria Tietke. These local dialects are stable for over 20 years, remarkably stable. Um, so this is also something we, we need to figure out now, how they can be so stable over such a long time if they are copying errors. Um, vocal learning occurs during this babbling, these long vocal sequences, and during this babbling, um, territorial songs are being acquired by pups listening to males singing every day. And songs attract females to roost. And something else I haven't told you, but we've done extensively in the past, songs, of course, also mediate aggressive male-male interactions, and we can actually do interactive playbacks with our males and ask them what, what makes you more aggressive or what makes you more, um, more docile. So it's a great species to work with, and uh, I think we have, we have 20 more exciting years ahead of us. And maybe at, at the very end, something I'd like to stress is this is not an unusual bat species at all. It's unusually well studied because its natural history allows you to do that with comparative ease. But in terms of its natural history, its diet, its social organization, nothing would have, you know, um, would have made me predict that this is a particularly vocally complex species. So I'm convinced that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are much more 
interesting species out there, I think, in in uh, in, in this um, large taxon of bats. And uh, it would be great if more species could study them. And of course, I'm not studying them alone. I have an awesome lab, and I'd like to thank all of them uh, and my funding sources. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Miriam. Wow, that was a lot as usual. I mean, these talks are always so uh, inspiring and we have so much to go off. So this is wonderful. And it's actually been a while since we had some bats in our in our, um, in our talk series. So this is great for all the bat lovers like me out there. Um, so I think we can open some questions. We do have some in the chat. I don't know if people would like to share the questions that they had put in the chat. I'm also happy to read those. Um, would anybody like to set us off with some questions? Yes, Joanne. Hi, how are you, Joanne? I'm good. Good morning, everyone. Thank Hi. you so much Hi. for this talk. Absolutely amazing. I wanted to start us off with the, uh, a, a question that always intrigues me regarding charismatic species and how charismatic species usually receive most attention. I wanted you to talk to us a little bit about the difficulties of studying a non considered non charismatic species. <laughs> What are you talking about? They're adorable. <laughs> no, I totally oh, know I what agree. you mean. <laughs> no, I, I, I absolutely agree. And I agree with Kate. Yeah. I'm a bad person too. Yeah, um, great. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I think that there's a, um, a lot of difficulties that people face whenever they are um, encounter negative representations of bats. Absolutely. And I think the corona pandemic hasn't hasn't done, you know, bats or bat researchers a lot of good with that regard. Yes. I remember that I did um, I did a project on, on other species in southern Africa once in Kruger National Park. And um, we were repeatedly asked by tourists if we had done anything wrong to annoy our professor so that we had to work on bats and couldn't work on elephants or lions or something like that. I was like, no, no, we're doing that on purpose. <laughs> So um, I think it's a in in terms of funding, I think it's it's not that much of a problem. You could actually, I mean, sometimes it's easier to work with the less charismatic species because um, you, you have more freedom to do so. Um, and in terms of the representation, I just try to like always use pictures in which my bats look friendly and um, you know <laughs> try to present them in the best possible light. But but I think the lesson in there is that the more you learn about any species, I guess, the more fascinated you get and the, the deeper the questions you can ask. So um, I, I'm not sure that I, I have an answer to to the problem you you point out. It, it hasn't harmed me personally, but I've certainly encountered it. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally get you. There's just some research that shows that charismatic species often receive way more attention, more funding, etc. So I'm just glad you have been able mm -hmm. to work around those things. And I'm really excited for your research. Thank you. Any other questions coming? Otherwise, we do have quite a few popping up. Oh, yeah, Malcolm. Fantastic. You're welcome to unmute yourself to ask your question. Okay. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Okay. Um, your talk, uh, Dr. Schnarshield, prompted a number of questions, one of which I think you answered. I wondered if bats were any good at mapping territory with their echolocation. That presents a whole different set of problems from zapping insects and stuff like that. I think you've shown that um, by listening to the calls of male bats, female bats get a kind of map of their territory. Um, but I also wondered about um, whether any bat brains have been found with uh, spindle neurons in them. I don't know that. Um, I, uh, I feel that mm -hmm. I should know that, and I don't. <laughs> 
yeah I'm, well I'm, they're characteristic we're... they're char mm -hmm. characteristic of large mammals like elephants mm -hmm. and whales and dolphins mm -hmm. so you wouldn't expect to find them in the bat brain but then again you find all kinds of unexpected things in unexpected mm -hmm. places in biology so i thought i'd ask mm -hmm. maybe uh hey. maybe the next when you when you next report to this group you can let us know <laughs> <laughs> i i will <laughs> Thank, thanks. Oh, the other question I had would be about the local dialects that are so mm -hmm. stable over time. Could they mm -hmm. be genetically encoded so that the bats um, don't have to learn them or sort of a prototype exists mm -hmm. in the mind? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I don't know that, but I wouldn't be surprised if some sort of prototype or template existed because that's what's also happening in a lot of songbirds, right? That they have like a go-to template if everything else fails. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if that was was the same default, in bats. Default mode. Yeah. Exactly, default Very mode. Very interesting. Um, what, we, what we do know is that the, the songs are are stable over uh, a surprisingly long time but we nevertheless know that they are learned so there must be some sort of stabilizing selection in a way that we haven't figured out yet because what we what we do know that's data i haven't shown you is we have recorded um these pup precursor songs in a lot of different colonies and compared them to the songs of their social father so the tutor they were actually hearing and in half of our bats um, colonies got destroyed and impregnated mothers moved to new colonies. So these pups wow. were growing up with a social father that was not their biological father. So we actually had like a, a, a lucky built in control, so to speak, to basically test whether, you mm -hmm. know, they, the songs of the pups would resemble their biological father or their social father. And it turns out they resemble the social father. So we, mm. we certainly know whether there is an innate template or not, which I wouldn't be surprised if there was, um, we know that what they're hearing when they're growing up every day really matters to them. Um, yeah. And we also know that this kind of makes sense in 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 a way because um, so the, these males they stay together in in their natal colony, so all males in a colony are somewhat related to one another, right? Um, mm -hmm. Apart from the males that, you know, come in, um, you know, because mothers get impregnated somewhere else and they grow up there. But it seems as if that colony signature is really what keeps the males together and what distinguishes them from intruding males that are sometimes trying to sneak in and maybe, you know, steal a copulation or something like that. Well, in America, we have a saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Maybe mm -hmm. they do it because it works. That's I think them. I think that's true for, for for a lot of things in evolution, right? I mean, they only have to work, you know, as as good as they have to. They don't have to be perfect solutions. Yeah, right. absolutely. Great, thank, thank you, you, Malcolm. Uh, Gabrielle, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, we can. Yes. Lovely. Um, I have two questions. My first, well, thank you, first of all. It's a very interesting talk. Um, I do wonder if you have any comments on um, the kind of general effect of noise pollution on bat species, especially ones that kind of live in cities. Um, I know that you've probably published a lot on that, but I just wanted to hear more thoughts mm -hmm. about that. And similarly, um, I think I posted about this in the chat, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about the kind of general move of having AI used for unearthing like non-human communications and if I know there's like maybe less of a focus with that in your research but I wonder if you could speak to the larger perils of the type of research um we these groups would be doing and how that affects back communities in terms of their safety and um yeah okay I'll, I'll try to other that answer that stepwise so um I think noise pollution pollution is an issue uh, it's special is especially an issue for the bats that are relying on prey generated sounds like the ones that are listening to frogs or katydids calling that's of course really masked by traffic noise for instance then of course some social vocalizations are also being um masked bats have lumbar effects so they try to like just call louder when they're in noise and some species have also been shown to shift their frequencies out of the basically the polluted range 
and then sometimes these shifts are persistent um so we know they're affected we just don't know how well they can cope quite yet because so many different things are changing at the same times so, right cities are not only getting louder they're also getting hotter and they are you know there are less insects or other prey available so we have all these detrimental effects and we cannot really tease them necessarily well apart so my even though I'm not like an expert in that field per se, I would say, yes, they are affected, but it may be a lesser concern than some of the other more lurking problems, but it may be the last nail in the coffin for, for all we know, right? So it's it's really hard to, um, they're endangered pretty much everywhere. So um, yeah, that's that's difficult. Um, right. Regarding your second question, that was the, the use of AI in, mm -hmm. um, analyzing um, bat communication or also bat conservation, if I understood you correctly. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. um, I, I think it's a really powerful new method and it will certainly help us deal with, you know, large data, with the annotation, also the interpretation of large data. I personally, and I guess as a behavioral, you know, ecologist or evolutionary ecologist, I have to say that obviously the models are only as good as the input data that is getting in. So I think we still need people like me who <laughs> spent their days just, you know, out there looking at animals, <laughs> trying to obviously with the help of, you know, high speed recordings and acoustic cameras and stuff like that, and trying to document and interpret behavior to then, of yeah. course, make AI models better. But especially when it comes to bioacoustic monitoring and automatic species identification or just larger, broader context, like is this bat commuting or is it feeding, which is like it, that's right. not so hard to, to tell apart. I think um, that's that's a really um, um, a really promising uh, research avenue to to go for. And, and with bioacoustic monitoring, we will have mm -hmm. so many data, we, we will not be able to handle that. Um, properly yeah, yeah. without AI help. And it's, at least in Europe, um, we don't have, we have declining populations of pretty much all the bat species all over Europe, but we don't have exact numbers. We don't have population estimates, first of all, because in migratory species, you don't know really what a population is anyway. That's not making it easier. And mm -hmm. we don't have long-term data and long-term monitoring trends. We, we only know where we count the numbers are going down, but we don't know by, you know, how, how widespread uh, or global that problem is. Um, and right. for that, we need acoustic monitoring. And for that, we need AI tools to handle right. that. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Joanne, did you have another question? I do, but I'm happy to leave it for someone else. Okay, maybe we can go to Diana and then I'll skip back to you. Uh, you can go ahead first. I'll, I'll wait. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead, John. <laughs> so I have a question about the babbling. So mm -hmm. um, in the late 90s, Brenda McGowan released an article with other colleagues uh, using Zip's law uh, on mm -hmm. bottlenose dolphins. And, and I know uh, Dr. Rice probably have something to say about that too. Um, and I'm wondering in the studies from your graduate student, if she did end up using some of these linguistics parameters to identify the babbling, or um, if it was mostly the uh, different, the other characteristics of babbling, like repetition and things like that, mm -hmm. that um, she used to identify that. She she mainly used these other parameters, but she's currently working on a set of different linguistic parameters, for instance, SIPS law. And we're also looking at, at syntax and uh, hyper volumes to basically get a better idea of how how this vocal space of pups is basically shaped and moving. So there is there's certainly more work to do in that area. Yeah, I'm, I'm really fascinated about that. And that, another thing that intrigues me is that we are so much more inclined to use the language that we use for humans to talk about uh, mother and uh, pups relationships, right? So we use babbling, but then we use, for example, um, um, signature calls to talk about the ways that naming practices are done right in different species. So anyways, just a, just a comment. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And I'm, I'm personally also not I don't really know how I feel about the word babbling. If I'm honest, I personally prefer vocal play. 
and I would love to have a way to measure, you know, dopamine in the bat's brain because I think they like it when they do that. But obviously, I, I don't, I don't have any idea how to do that yet without uh, significantly harming the animals. But I, I, I think vocal play for, for me is is the more accurate term. But that's, I think it's not very used in 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 the linguistic literature, especially not in that we were aiming more for that canonical babbling sort of period, because that's the one that has also been mainly been compared to, to birdsong. So that's why we stuck with that name. But names are complicated, right? Because everyone yeah. has different associations with them. And if you use a very clinical term, then no one knows what you you know what you mean necessarily and your sentences i'm german right my sentences are really long and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm happy for every label that i can have but um yeah I, i'm yeah I, I prefer vocal play and and labels are complicated yeah i i understand i think that there there, there are serious dangers of anthropomorphizing but there's also really important things about recognizing our similarities when we use mm -hmm. language that makes us equals so mm -hmm. uh, so there's the, definitely a fine line to play that uh, scientists have to play when they are using different naming practices absolutely diane thanks joan yeah, I'm glad I, I went and waited because I, I think I can respond to something else that was just said. Um, yeah, so Brenda McCowan and I are, have been colla had collaborated on a lot of that work. The work she did on Ziff's Law was actually data that I had collected on vocal ontogeny. Um, Brenda and I, she was in my lab, we published a lot together. And yeah, we saw, it was, I love this talk, first of all. Thank you, Miriam, for such an elegant and beautiful, beautifully crafted talk that really walked us through all the beautiful details of your work. So that was just a, a, an exceptionally wonderful talk, I think. Um, I just want to thank you. No, I loved it. And what, I think on the babbling end, uh, we published, Brenda and I published together many years ago, using the term babbling, but also vocal play, because we were mm -hmm. torn between those. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's interesting when you get into speaking about whether there's something reinforcing about it. With children, we acknowledge that crib talk when 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 young children are practicing by themselves it may be an extension of that so it, it's really hard to know you know but mm -hmm. um no I appreciate what you were saying so the question I had um for you was this is a little bit different it I two questions that are kind of coupled um one was when you were talking about the isolation calls of the bats mm -hmm. um are do you consider those contact calls or are they are they different as well I could you just I wasn't sure if mm -hmm. though you could interchangeably it, 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 mm -hmm. it, it really depends on the species so in some species adults have contact calls that are similar or different from the isolation calls that pups are producing so it really depends on the species in in Sacopteryx, the one i've been talking about mainly they have isolation calls that they don't have contact calls later on at, at as adults. They they don't have them at all because they forage solitarily and they congregate every day in the same roosting structure. So there's no need for like group cohesion. Everyone knows where to go basically. So they don't have such a call type. But interestingly, this um, isolation call that the pups are producing to solicit care and we've done playbacks with mothers and they show phonotaxis and they respond and, and all sorts of that is later on as adults used as well in order to as an appeasement signal so when two uh, dominant males are fighting and one male is in trouble and is wanting to be submissive they start producing isolation calls and we are thinking what they are trying to do is make them safe themselves smaller basically and acknowledge defeat so in this species the isolation call in adults in certain circumstances is used as an appeasement signal, but that wouldn't hold for all the different bats and not all the species have contact calls. So it's, um, yeah, I know in primates, they, I think they have contact calls and isolation calls when yes. they're truly mm -hmm. isolated, if I'm not mistaken. But I guess the other question on this was, do, when you looked, when you, when, when you're looking at, um, the fact that you could differentiate these different groups, the three different groups, mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. was, I think, based on the song. Did you do that on contact? Mm -hmm. Did you do that on the isolation calls 
is there something mm -hmm. yeah i don't know if this yes. is too deep. so no 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 we 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 did a really similar analysis on the isolation calls and they also they not only have individual signatures they have age signatures and group signatures as well so they have I mean, all of that we didn't look at population signatures but that's something we could do we just haven't done that yeah. because it's because the 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 males that are using them as adults stay in the same area so there is no real exchange really yeah it's interesting to see what what the best predictor would be that would differentiate one individual from another if you're looking at their isolation calls i'm asking because we're looking at this with mm -hmm. with dolphins too and we had mm -hmm. seen mm -hmm. many years ago back in 1997 i guess we published a, a paper um showing that we could differentiate dolphins whose calls looked quite similar um, mm -hmm. And it was based on the first frequency, the initial frequency. And there's some, there's, and that seemed to be the same uh, predictor in some in some monkey species when you looked at social group level contact mm -hmm. calls. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I just thought, we can we can talk more afterwards. I was going to just yeah, ask I'd you love about that. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. thank you again for a beautiful talk. Thanks. My pleasure. Does anybody else have any questions to add to add to the discussion? I don't know, Miriam, if you've seen, there's also a few comments in, in the chat. I think I, we, I have, I'm just looking at that. Yeah. yeah. I think we got through most of them. We had Gabrielle yeah. and Malcolm. Uh, yeah. The, the, um, the spindle so, neurons. Yeah. I, I will look that up. I have no mm -hmm. idea. Do bat researchers need to take special protection measures to prevent catching disease from the bats? Um, depends on where you are. Um, in, in caves, especially in Africa, I would definitely use a mask. Um, otherwise, of course, we use gloves, but that's more to protect our bats, <laughs> you know, from, from catching anything from us, really. So I mainly work in the neotropics and in Europe, and there, apart from rabies, there's really nothing to worry about from bats, and we are vaccinated against rabies. So we use protection, but we use it to protect the bats from anything me we might have. Um, but in in Africa, especially working with some of the larger fruit bats in Africa, I would definitely use um, protection for myself as well. And, and of course the normal vaccinations. Um, then the, the difference to the dolphin signature whistle, that really depends on how you define signature, I guess. So we, we have individual differences in, in songs and also in isolation calls and other vocalizations. Um, but we don't have others addressing our bats with these signature whistles. I think that that's that's part of the whole naming thing that we haven't found in bats. So we have personal information encoded in all these vocalizations and we call them signatures. But when other bats are referring to a particular individual, they are not using the signature of that bat. So that, that may be different. Um, um, and the AI, I think we've covered. Um... There's one from Josh. I don't know, Josh, if you'd yeah. like to ask your question. It's it's a bit of a long one. And maybe in the meantime, we can go to Jonathan, who's raised his hand oh. um, as well. If you want to ask a question, you can open your mic if you'd like, Jonathan, and ask that one. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Miriam. Fascinating. I was amazed at how you could hear the calls of these bats from that little island from such a distance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I wondered also, though, in relevant to that, is there any chance that these calls could be detected by predators? I'm thinking of a big bat like the spectral bat, um, which mm -hmm. can prey on other bats. And is mm -hmm. there any possibility that acoustic, acoustically orienting predators might place constraints on the calls, the the duration, the the intensity, mm -hmm. the how localizable, how local localizable mm -hmm. it is. So, just curious if there's any evidence for that in these bats. Mm -hmm. I think that's an there's an that's an excellent question, and yes, there certainly is. So we have a couple of um, acoustically oriented predators that would really try to sneak in these day roosts. It's, it's common knowledge where the where they are because these bats are so noisy, right? We we know how to find them. So so every raccoon every coati you know everyone with ears basically 
<laughs> you know, in the audible range knows how to find them. Birds, uh, also um, some long-legged forest falcons will try to come in and grab uh, some roosting bats. They really don't sleep during the day and they're all constantly alert and vigilant. So normally when they're healthy and they're not weakened by any like, you know, insect decline or anything, they can normally evade these predators, but they will never leave their pups in the roost at night. And I think we they do that for precisely that reason, because the roost is so obvious during the day, there are just no safe spots um, at night for non-volant animals. So they take them away and park them somewhere in the forest. And um, mm. we've also done hearing thresholds in a couple of different species. And there, there is a few um, um, bat species that live in um, in tents or in rolled up uh, heliconia leaves, and they have really high echolocation calls, and they don't use prey generated sounds. So our prediction was that they have a really um, that they have really poor hearing in the low frequency ranges because what would they need it for, right? And it turns out they hear really well in these low frequency ranges, and there we think it's exactly the opposite. They are listening into monkeys coming in because um, they will, you know, hit these, um, the tents that the bats are making or, you know, chew on these um, rolled up leaves where the bats are inside. So we think it, it's selection going in, in both directions, right? So sometimes hearing thresholds of, of bats can be shaped by predators, um, you know, so that they can detect predators. And on the other hand, predators can, you know, cue in on, on social vocalizations. So for instance, I think one of the best examples going back to our bats is the males come in the morning at first after, you know, at, at night, the day roosts are deserted and the males fly in at first and they sit very prominently in their territory and they sing. And if the males don't do that, the females are very reluctant to fly in the colony at all, because I think what the males are doing is really putting themselves on the spot. They're basically, you know, they're basically, basically um, announcing that the roost is safe because if it wasn't, you know, <laughs> they would be eaten by now. And um, the females really use that. So when we sometimes in the morning accidentally catch a harem male, we have to let it go almost immediately because otherwise the females will just, you know, fly around the day roost but not settle down because I think they know something is amiss then. I hope that answers the question, Jonathan. Oh yeah, thanks very much. Yes, fantastic. Uh, Treasure, you're next in our, in our line, and then I'll ask Josh's question as the final question, mm -hmm. I think, because we can, yeah, we're almost at time. Go ahead. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting conversation. Um, I just had a quick anatomy question. I noticed that the ears and the mouth, uh, the roof of the mouth have these uh, convolutions. Uh, they kind of look like mm -hmm. waveguides. Are they individual mm -hmm. to that, or is that just a, a thing that all of them share? I mean, that it's, it's not individual to like a fingerprint on a person, which each mm -hmm. bat ear and mouth have a certain pattern that maybe could add mm -hmm. distinction to them as an individual? That's Thank an you. interesting question. I don't know that. So I know that these, at least the ridges in the mouth are species specific. And in some species, they're even used to tell different species apart how many ridges they have in the in the top of their mouth. And I think in the ears, it's mainly for like um, adding more richness and and perceptual depth um, uh, to the echoes that are that are coming in. So they they hear better and they have better like three D hearing and detection abilities when they have these riches. But I don't know if anyone has ever looked at if there are individual differences. I know that people work on wing prints, so the the um, uh, the, the 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 texture and the layers of this um, these uh, collagenous fiber tissues in the bat wing membranes they are like in like a fingerprint so they are individually distinct so it's possible that that occurs for the ear, um, is the same for the ears but I don't think anyone has ever looked it's interesting if anybody knows the answer to this you can also share it in our Slack afterwards it's always a good place to share these these bits and bobs so if you have any info on that, that would be great to follow up. I'll share the link to the, the Slack group in the chat. Uh, I have the final question, which is coming from our chat and Josh posed this, but doesn't have a microphone. So I'm going to read it for you. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if the individuals attracted to the foreign dialects were always distinct from those attracted to the local dialects. Probably the sample size was too small to say anything with certainty, but it would be interesting to know if individuals have a strong preference for one versus the other, even if the general trend is towards a preference for local. 
That's a really excellent question. And unfortunately, the sample size was too small to say anything about that. So it's, it was only two individuals out of the ones that we had that preferred the the other dialect. And um, we don't know why they did that. There were dispersal females like the others. We couldn't detect any, any differences um, between them. Again, it, it may be an example of that the system doesn't have to be perfect to be functioning. Right, so there could be mistakes or also sl slack in in judgment, uh, or maybe there is something more behind, and we'd have to look at a at a larger scale. But with the data that we have, we they, they looked like every other dispersal female to us. Right. Oh, and what I've just seen in the chat, yes, of course, I've read "Listening in the Dark." It's an amazing book. I can uh, uh, Griffin is is one of my personal superheroes, so I can only highly recommend that. Good. So we all have some homework then. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Always good to get extra research because I know that we're all already fascinated by this and, and really deep into our own worlds. And this gives us a forum to kind of share the worlds together. So this is really wonderful. As I said, lots of bat lovers amongst us and also usually you know we've got a lot of dolphin lovers as well we have Malcolm always mm -hmm. as a dolphin evangelist but today we're mixing it up so mm -hmm. it's really really wonderful to have to have um, you come and talk with us today Miriam thank you so much for your time on behalf of the whole organization this has been a really wonderful talk and I hope everybody is ready for a, a Sunday reading because we all have our our recommendation. So thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you in our next talk.